greetings again in Jesus' name. What I want to do here is clarify some more things about repentance and faith proven by deeds. Even the people out of the system don't seem to grasp the importance of what we're saying here and exactly what we're saying. So I want to lay out exactly what I mean when I mean when I say that repentance and faith must be proven by deeds. I want to, I want to lay it out one more time and clarify it in this message, this lesson, to once and for all conclude what we mean by that. When I was back in the church, I was thinking today, I would read in James, like I said, I came into the church not under this delusion and stuff. You, you've, all, you've heard that if you've, you've heard my videos. So I read in the scriptures, I read in James 2.24 that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone, or by works and not by faith alone, as it says in the King James Bible. But I think that even more clarifies that man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. So faith alone should have been cast out of doors a long time ago. But I could never get the pastors to say this in the pulpit. And they wouldn't allow me to get up there and say it. And I didn't understand why. Because it said it in the scriptures. See, they were caught up in it's not of works, at least anyone should boast. Two, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So to them, they would always say, yes, James is teaching us that faith follows good works. That's the best they would do. Some of them don't even do that now. But that's the best they would do then. But they would never say that it was synonymous with faith. That deeds and faith were synonymous, one and the same thing in the scriptures. Faithfulness, as it's translated really in the scriptures. The just shall live by faith. From Habakkuk, meaning the just shall live by faithfulness to God's commands. They would never say that. So what did they really mean? They really meant, even though I didn't quite realize it then, we just went along with, yeah, if good works should be produced and they should be living the life and all that. They would agree with all those things that James said. The man is justified by what, he, by, uh, what he does and not by faith alone, meaning that the works follow the faith. But what they really meant, because it wasn't synonymous with the faith, they really meant the opposite. They meant you're saved by faith alone, apart from any deeds, and then good works will follow. But those good works are optional, right? They're not necessary. It's not a necessity to perform the works of righteousness and purity and sincerity and love with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength to enter the kingdom. That's the best they could, they could ever say. They were never able to separate it in their minds between the works of faith or the deeds of faith and the works of the law as we pointed out in, in many of our messages, our lessons. They were never able to separate that out. And I didn't understand why they wouldn't. It kept trying for many years to get them to understand that it was synonymous with one another if a person was really saved. Then they had the dynamic of a faithfulness working within them, believing from their heart, being purified, and, and living without this sin and rebellion and, and evil dispositions that all people had in the churches but they'd never understand it. Well, moving on. The scripture makes clear, like in Acts 26, 20, when Paul was talking and testifying about the gospel, and he repeated again that they should repent and turn to God and perform deeds worthy of repentance. That was his message. And we see the same thing in James 2.24 that I read earlier that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Again, should cast away all notions of faith alone or doing nothing or that man has an inability and all that kind of stuff right out the window, but it doesn't. And of course, we know that it was bring forth fruits or deeds worthy of repentance in uh, Matthew 3, 8 and 9 and Luke 3, 8 and 9 when the gospel commenced. See, that was the imperative in the entire scriptures. The imperative of Bible preaching. Man commanded. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's, look, at it, look at it in the original language. It's an imperative. You're commanded to turn from your sins. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your soul. If you're going to find mercy in redemption, the only way you're going to find it is through the method prescribed in the scriptures. 
Let the evil man forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and then let him turn to God and seek his mercy. He'll find that mercy, but not if he still has that guile left in his heart. But the doctrinal fallacy of substitution has canceled out man's ability to obey and make a clean break from his sins. On both sides of the coin now. Those that are out there street preaching, most, most of the ones I've heard, and definitely the ones inside the church, they don't get a clue. They don't have a clue what it is. See, when you offer somebody an alternative to their deeds done in repentance, then they're going to take that path of least resistance and get a supposed salvation on the wide road of destruction. That's what millions of people have done. It never stops sinning. Because it's not an imperative that they do. You see what I'm saying? And that's what repentance is all about. See, the fallacy, what the fallacy of substitution has done is they've taken this atonement concept from the Old Testament sacrificial system and misapplied it to the gospel message of redemption. The sacrificial system under Moses, as we pointed out before, was never intended to be a substitute for obedience. It's like... Uh, Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel uh, 15, 22, to obey is better than sacrifice. And we see in the scriptures, uh, obedience and not just sacrifice. And these sacrifices and offerings did not apply or cover any willful or deliberate sins, only sins done in ignorance. Even the Day of Atonement, as pointed out in Hebrews 9, 7, was for sins performed in ignorance. Why was that? Well, because sins, deliberate sins, brought death. As the scripture says, in the testimony of two or three witnesses, you were put to death, Hebrews 10, 26, under Moses' law. So the only reprieve from that type of sin and willful rebellion was repentance proven by deeds. There was no offering, no appeasement, no satisfaction that could reprieve you from that sin. Only repentance proven by deeds. If we look at Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 doesn't prove the original sin, folks, in verse 5. That we, we, we've been over that many times. We're not talking about that. But in Psalm 51, we see that it was a clean heart, free from guile, that the Lord required and not sacrifice. David says in verse uh, 16, For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it. See, there's no sacrifice for what he did. There's no burnt offerings. There's no substitution, in other words. You see what I'm saying? That's what, that's what they've done with this atonement message. It's a substitution. So there was no substitution or he would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Thou, Lord, you will not despise. In other words, somebody that's come clean with him. Read Psalm 32. You see the same attitude there. Blessed is the man in whose heart there is no guile, he says there. <clears throat> not that they select a few select verses out of that psalm, applying them to Romans chapter 4 and saying that a man's sins are covered and he's justified in his sins. That's what, no, that's not at all what David is saying. You see what he's saying here? You come clean with God. So there's no, under this, under this atonement idea, under this atonement idea, we've got the substitution and the satisfaction All an appeasement, appeasement to God's anger, to divert his anger, or to pay in full for it, of course, under penal substitution. All an alternative, that's all it boils down to, all this is an alternative. Well, we see in the Old Testament that there was no alternative in David's case. Of course, this is a rare case of a second repentance. It's not a license for somebody to say, well, hey, I can commit adultery and uh, murder somebody and, and repent just like David. No, it's likely not to happen. You might more, more than likely be like Esau, who sought diligently with tears after repentance and could not find it because he'd went too far. So you sell your birthright, folks. You sell your, your opportunity to come clean with God. He's long-suffering. He's kind. He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment through his spirit. He's reaching forth his hand to a rebellious people all day long. That's what he's doing. He doesn't have to actually come in and coerce you, change your desires for you. No, man's only unwilling in the sense that he loves his sin. 
Not everybody in the whole world is unwilling to seek God. That those that seek God find Him in the Scriptures. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be answered. He rewards those that diligently seek Him. What, seek Him because He made them seek them? No, of their own free will, in volition, seek Him. That's how. So that's the great divide we have between this and the deeds. Deeds equals ability. Ability. That's what we mean. So when we say, when we say repentance and faith proven by deeds, we're saying man has the ability to perform those deeds. Here, he doesn't have the ability to perform the deeds, so there's an alternative to the deeds that Christ provided in a provisionary sacrifice to his deeds that he trusts in, receives, then maybe he'll have the ability to stop sinning. Most of them say that, but they don't really, it never really comes to happen. So there's our great divide. We say that man has full and unhindered ability to make a free will choice to stop sinning and seek God. We're not saying it's going to be easy for somebody that's been under the influence of drugs and pornography and lust and all the filth of this world for a long, long time. It's not. That's why we say a process of repentance, a self-cleansing humility season of godly sorrow that must take place. That's the whole problem. They don't have the time for it in the churches. And apparently the street preachers don't care because they think this alternative thing is going to, going to fix, up, fix it all up and the person is going to magically stop sinning when they receive Jesus. Well, I don't really see it happening. Okay, that's number one. Number two, that he does not have to be made willing by some magical force or coerced to offset his inability, some kind of inability hindered. See, they, 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 street preachers say they don't believe in the sin nature. Church, of course, he's got the sin nature. He can't do anything. But they say he doesn't. But we, still, somehow, us has to, God has to tweak him somehow to offset his inability. No, we preach... The gospel, turn from your sin and turn to God and prove your repentance by your deeds, as I presented it. And then the conviction of the Holy Spirit pressed upon their conscience, then they make the choice, either to choose to receive it, as some you see in the book of Acts. What must we do to be saved? They cried out. Others picked up rocks and stoned them, and, or went away and huffed away. So here there's nothing some mystical force or some kind of coercion or something to offset his, his inability or his corrupted nature or all that other stuff. That's all under this alternative to deeds. So you're, what you're doing is you're giving man another excuse. That's exactly what, what's being done here. You're giving him another excuse not to obey. You're taking away the sin nature. You're saying that he has to stop sinning. You're saying he's got to obey God. But then you take away his ability to do it by saying Christ made this substitution or satisfaction for him. Another excuse. I don't know why you can't see it. And that man, number three, man has the ability to pass through this season of godly sorrow from sin, make amends for his sins, clear himself of his wrongdoings, and finally come clean with God before he's granted mercy at the mercy seat and receives the reconciliation Return to favor, and then the Holy Spirit's granted to him. Is the Holy Spirit at work in that period? Yes, the Holy Spirit's at work in that period of time. But he's not indwelling the person at that time until he comes clean with God. Then it's granted. That's how the gospel was preached for hundreds of years before it got all messed up with the Catholic Church. And then in the Reformation. And finally, that this repentance alone is sufficient to return him to favor with God, remit his past sins, and wash and redeem and renew his heart, mind, soul, and spirit in regeneration. Washing and renewing and regeneration of the spirit, like Titus says. This repentance alone is sufficient. The deeds done in repentance. He does not need the, the satisfaction of public justice or the wrath of God to be uh, extinguished upon Christ, or sin to be transferred, and righteousness to be... No. 
That's all appeasement. That's, that is a fallacy. A fallacy that's been ingrained into the minds of people for hundreds and hundreds of years, possibly even thousands. And it all boils down to taking away his ability to perform these deeds. So that's why very few are getting saved. You introduce the notion that Christ had to make some kind of provision that he can trust in as an alternative to the obedience of repentance proven by deeds, and man is never going to be able to escape the corruption influence of sin. And he'll be forever in bondage to the slavery of sin, imagining that he's saved in this sin-repent, sin-repent mode, trusting in that myth, rather than he could have been redeemed and ransomed and released from bondage of slavery to sin through a true reconciliation. That's what you're giving him. That's exactly what you're giving him. So you're giving him a myth to trust in that he can somehow look to the cross as a satisfaction for public justice or that the wrath of God's been extinguished even though the, son, the wrath of God does come on the sons of disobedience, the scripture says in the New Testament in Ephesians 5, 7 and other places. You give him an excuse not to obey. See, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, it says in 1 John 3. He didn't come to do that by giving man an excuse to flout his responsibility to obey the truth, or his duty to obey the truth. See, preaching in the gospel in such manner that negates this ability to bring forth deeds worthy of repentance is throwing the entire purpose for which Christ came out the window. That's what people have done. So you got substitution, atonement, satisfaction, appeasement. This alternative is another gospel. If they didn't have that word in the first century, Paul called it another gospel in Galatians chapter 1. It's an alternative gospel. It's an alternative to deeds. Instead of repentance proven by deeds, it's a provision that nullifies obedience by giving man a way, the wide road, to escape his duty instead of escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust. And be redeemed from every lawless deed and purified. As Titus talks about what the real, real meaning of grace. Titus 2, 11 through 14. See, that's the spirit of fallacy that's in the churches. And we've been trying to unravel this thing for years in people's minds. And we keep coming up with more and different methods to try to clarify these things and make it more crystalline in the minds of people that listen to us. And we still get accused of preaching sinless perfection and preaching that, that you, have, you have to stop sinning yourself and, and nobody can stop sinning until they have Jesus and, and all that other stuff. I don't know how much more clear we could make it here, what real repentance is. See, these wolves in the system, they have the appearance of a lamb and they speak the language of the dragon. They mix truth with error. They mix a little truth with a whole lot of error. And then they moralize about doing right and sinning less and being a good person and all that stuff. But then they have the central doctrinal tenet of inability injected into the people's minds. So all their talk about obedience is fruitless. We see that in the promise keepers rallies. It's totally fruitless because there's no crucifying of the flesh with its passions and desires and repentance and there's no necessity for it. Why? Because there's been a provision made. And if we can just get them to trust in that provision, then maybe they'll stop. Well, these preachers that go to produce these rallies should ask themselves, have you stopped? More than likely not. Because you believe in the same lie. You've never been redeemed. So you have it. At the top, we have original sin. Or inability. We always have inability, original sin. That's what original sin is, inability. The sin nature, the inbred sin, moral depravity, all the rest of it that they called it throughout history. So we had to necessitate then a substitution in all its various forms 
arguing about it for the last thousand years, up all through the Reformation, to necessitate some kind of a moral transfer so our sins could be forgiven in advance and covered because we're so sinful we can never stop sinning. We can never come clean with God from our, vile, our vileness. See, when they say you can never stop sinning, they mean you can never stop fornicating and getting drunk and looking at filthy stuff and all. That's what they mean. But that's what they're preaching. And the fallacy of then justification by faith alone while you're still in your sins and then God's going to clean you up later. It's like the tree preachers almost say the same thing. They say, well, you're going to stop sinning when you receive Jesus. How? You didn't go through the process of self-cleansing humility in repentance. You offered him an alternative to that. His sin's never going to stop. He may for a while. He may f try and fail and try and fail. So what do you tell him? Well, sin, repent, sin, repent. As long as you're on the repent side, when you die, you're okay. It's ridiculous. It's not what John's talking about in 1 John chapter 1. So we got reconciliation versus atonement. The reconciliation returned to favor through repentance and faith proven by deeds or an atonement that appeases God with some kind of substitution or satisfaction to man's obedience. So they throw the works of the law and the works of faith as I started out with. They don't understand because man's inability. So just like I said back in the day, I didn't understand why the preachers couldn't say that faith and obedience were synonymous to each other because faithfulness and obedience was the same one and the same thing. Well, they couldn't say that because it's not of works in their mind. In their mind, it was faith alone. Even though James said, he specifically pointed out it was not of faith alone. And still, these people clamor after Luther, the biggest heretic, one of the biggest heretics of all time, that said it was by faith alone. And even the Methodists and the so-called holiness preachers think they got saved under that message. I've read their testimonies. What a fallacy. 500 years of fallacy. Because they don't understand the simplicity between the faith, works of, deeds of faith and the works of the law. They don't understand it. And they won't. Because it would wreck their whole doctrinal fallacy of substitution. So you got the fallacies then of the wretched man and the chief of sinners and the filthy rags stuff. I, oh, I'm so tired of hearing the filthy rags thing. I hear these pundits, these, these so-called patriot pundits on radio and the internet radios saying that all I do is all filthy rags and they all think they're Christians. I'm so tired of hearing it. I have to turn it off. It frustrates me to no end to them representing a righteous and holy message while they align themselves with people that are ragged, sinful, vile people never really come to, out of their sins. And then they say everything they do is filthy rags. It's so ridiculous. And it plays right in to the false message that they criticize the churches for not coming out from under the government, the 501 thing, and that yet they all preach the same alternative message that you can't be pure and holy. Your righteousness is not filthy rags to God if you're presenting yourself worthy and acceptable to Him. May we serve Him with reverence and godly fear. Worthy, walk worthy of the Lord. So you got all these fallacies. The fallacy, the, the structure of the authority in the church, the invisible and the invisible church. Essentially, what, what people have done since the 4th century A.D., is they blended the three strikes in your out rule into Christian doctrine that shuts up the doors of the kingdom firm and tight against men. They don't go in and they, they don't let others to go in. So what they do is they preach this ear-tickling spell that puts people into a trance. They see but they don't perceive. They hear but they don't understand. They feel but they deny what they feel is conviction. And they say, well, that's the devil telling you you're not saved even though you're living in sin. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is made void, and the church is a farce, and most of mankind sets in there oblivious to the whole thing. So the game plan is strike one. They strip man of his ability to obey God, make a righteous judgment, choose freely to stop sinning. 
That's strike one. Strike two, if that wasn't enough already, strike two, then they write a doctrinal creed that has him totally depraved at birth, dead in his sins and wholly given over to his moral depravity and incapable of doing anything but sin. And that's infected all sides of this, except for the few of us out here in, in the wilderness trying to show you the right way. So yeah, it wasn't enough just to say that man doesn't have the ability to obey God. They had to create a doctrinal creed to, to cover that all and come up with this whole substitution, satisfaction, appeasement, and, and, and argue about that for centuries. And then finally, strike three, if that wasn't enough already, they top it off with a provision, gospel, that supports all the fallacies that they really believe in by taking this scripture and that scripture and this isolated passage and that one, and then they promise people the salvation and sin, imputed righteousness. Jesus obeyed for them, and he was righteous in their place, in eternal security. And he can trust in Jesus that he obeyed in his place, done deal. Strike one, two, and three, you're out. He's out of the game, so to speak. Man, in my baseball illustration. He's pronounced safe at home with the smooth-talking preachers. They act like the umpires here that say Jesus played the game for them. They don't even need to play the game. So you don't have to put forth any effort. Get up the plate and swing the bat, run the bases, or score any points. Run the race. The game's already played for you in advance. The victory's sealed, and you get the credit. It's a perfect setup to ensure that man is never going to inherit the kingdom or escape the corruption of sin. And unless you escape from that, then you're out of the game, so to speak. Because you've got to run the race. You've got to work out your salvation. You've got to make your calling and election sure because you have the ability to do so in faith, working by love, purifying your heart of sin and having victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. In faith, comes, it proceeds from man's heart. You believe from your heart that form of doctrine from which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves or servants of righteousness. The ability to obey and believe and faithfully seek after God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is within you to do so. It will happen by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If the gospel was preached properly, it would happen more often. But it's being preached in this other mode of alternative nonsense that man can somehow trust in something else to replace his deeds. You say, well, I can't do those deeds. I can't stop sinning. I can't obey. I keep failing. I have to have God to help me. God's already helped you to bring you to a repentance so you can come clean with him. So I don't know how much more clear I could make it. This is what we mean when we say repentance and faith proven by deeds. That man has the ability to perform those deeds. Unhindered ability to perform those deeds. And do so under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And go through that process to be reconciled back to God before he can receive the mercy and the regeneration that's in the Holy Spirit. It can happen. Nothing's impossible with God. But with the preaching we have today, they've made it almost an impossibility. I wish more of you preachers out there would wake up or you teachers on the internet to all this. This is the most important thing. Not arguing about the deity of Christ and all of those things are important tenets of the scriptures, which we firmly believe in. But this is the central issue that faces mankind now at this critical time in our history when the world's about to be plunged into the darkest abyss of tyranny that the world has ever known. And unless you wake up and see the light and go for it with all your might, you're going to be found wanting at that judgment and in sorrow sent away to weeping and gnashing of teeth. And not to end on a positive note, you can repent and you can do the deeds of repentance. It may not be easy, but you contact us at our Stand in the Gap, and you get our PDFs, and you read, and you study, and you dig, and you pray, and you talk to us, and you email us, and we'll help you through it as we've helped others to bring you to the full redemption that's in Christ.